Hi, it's me, Franklin, and here I am near a university. Since the start of the course, we've been talking about a lot of different things. We were thinking a little bit about what an operating system is before we started talking about some of the things that an operating system does. Two of the major things that we've talked about is this idea of things that do work. The two things that do work that we've talked about so far are processes and threads. Processes are things that are scheduled by our operating system, what we looked at last week, and those are coarse-grained concurrency mechanisms. They allow us to run multiple things at the same time, but each of those processes has their own virtual address space. They can't interfere with each other. They can communicate with each other with IPC, but they can't interfere with each other directly. Threads, on the other hand, work within the context of a single process. One of the issues that we saw with this, they share the same virtual address space, was this idea of race conditions and critical sections. The problem that we have there is that multiple threads of execution that are running the same statement of code where the same statement of code is referring to the same location in memory, and very specifically, each of these threads of execution are trying to update the same location in memory. Because those statements were not atomic, when the scheduler interrupts a thread while it's executing the instructions that that statement eventually becomes, we wind up with these issues where we get unexpected results. Once we saw that, one of the solutions that we had to trying to, to get these threads to behave the way that we want them to behave was to use locks. Locks are a way that we as a programmer can regain control of the order in which threads execute. We are retaking that from the scheduler and we're retaking that from the operating system. We've seen how to use locks. Now we need to know how locks are implemented. The reasons for this are twofold. One, we need to know how an operating system actually implements a lock. At this point, we've got this magic pthread mutex lock that just works. It prevents access from multiple threads for entering a single critical section or some section of code. But we have no idea what the operating system is actually doing underneath this to, to, to have this happen for us. So part of it is going to illustrate what the locks are actually doing. And the other part of it is from the operating system's perspective. Operating systems themselves don't, don't have pthreads. They don't have pthreads to work with. So an operating system has to have some kind of mechanism for locking critical sections within operating system code, within kernel code. And this is something that an operating system will have to implement on its own. On top of that, it's going to have to implement it on its own for all of the different kinds of architectures that the operating system is trying to support. In this chapter, in chapter 28, we're going to be looking at how locks are implemented and we're going to evaluate how those locks work. So we'll have a couple of metrics that we're going to use to evaluate how good a lock implementation is. And we're gonna look at several different implementations of locking mechanisms. Let's get ourselves on the same page in terms of what a lock is and what it does. A lock is a mechanism that we can use to control access to critical sections in code. Really what we're trying to do is have atomicity of statements. We want to make high level language statements and high level operations on things like data structures atomic from the perspective of multiple threads of execution. In the context that we're using locks, locks are basically variables. And this means that a lock is a thing. It's a thing that a thread of execution can hold. Here's a little code sample. In this, we've got this variable called mutex on line one. And then some stuff happens. And eventually a thread of execution calls lock on line three and it passes a reference to this mutex. At this point, one of two things can happen. One, there's no other thread of execution that currently holds that lock. And at that point, the thread of execution that is running this statement right now acquires that lock. So it's holding on to it. As soon as that statement finishes, 
execution will continue for that. So it will then update balance and then it will do an unlock on the mutex itself. The other thing that can happen is that the lock is already held by another thread of execution. So on line three, if the lock is already held by some other thread of execution, the thread of execution that's currently running this code will block. It's going to stop there and it's going to have to wait until that lock is released by the other thread of execution that currently holds it. The second operation here is unlock, and this is on line five. Once we've entered the critical section, we are currently holding that lock. Two things can happen when we try to unlock that lock. The first thing is that there are no other threads of execution that are waiting and the lock is just released and it's not held by anybody anymore. The other thing that can happen is that there are other threads of execution that are waiting for that lock. They're waiting to acquire that lock and they are blocked on line three. In that case, the thread is going to not just release the lock and then nobody holds it, but it will release the lock and some other thread of execution will acquire that lock on line three and start entering that critical section. This whole problem with critical sections and data races on adding threads of execution to our code, concurrency and multi-threaded code, the issues that we have with that are entirely related to scheduling being outside of our control. The operating system is responsible for choosing which thread of execution gets to go next. When we added locks to our codes, that means that we as a programmer are retaking some of that control from the operating system. We are using these locks to enforce a certain order of execution. P-thread locks are the ones that we've seen now, and these are a specific implementation of a lock. P-thread locks are mutexes. This is a short way to say mutual exclusion. And this effectively means that one thread of execution can have access to a critical section that's surrounded by a p-thread mutex lock at a time. Exactly one and no others. We can translate that, that section of code that has this abstract lock and unlock function with p-thread mutex lock, and it looks effectively the same. We've got this operation where we try to lock something, and we've got this operation where we try to lock something. We've used these locks already, or at least we've seen them being used in programs, and we will be using them soon. Using them is, is important. It's important for us to be able to know how to use these locking mechanisms. But like I said, it's also important for us as people who are studying the implementation of operating systems, it's important for us to know how these locks are actually implemented. To build a lock, we need to have hardware support. This is an ongoing theme. When we execute code directly on a CPU, we needed hardware support to help us regain control of the processor. We used that hardware support when we were talking about scheduling to help us regain control of the processor, and then that permitted us to switch between processes. We use this hardware support with things like system calls so that we can regain control of the processor and so that we can cleanly separate things that user processes can do and things that operating systems can do. We're gonna take a look at a couple of different examples of implementing locks with hardware support. We're also going to be looking at how to evaluate locks. So these implementations are going to rely on different kinds of hardware support they're going to work in different ways and we need to be able to evaluate how good or bad those locks are actually going to be if we were to try to use them in practice. We're gonna evaluate implementations of locks on a couple of different criteria. The first one is mutual exclusion. So that's a pretty important feature of a lock. Does it actually prevent multiple threads of execution from entering a critical section? We're gonna be evaluating locks on fairness. Fairness here is explicitly if a thread of execution attempts to acquire a lock, can we guarantee that it will eventually get access to that lock? To be clear, this is not saying if a thread of execution acquires a lock and then runs in an infinite loop forever, no other threads of execution will get access to that lock. That's not what fairness is here but rather with well-behaved threads of execution, one that locks and then unlocks, 
and it does so in a finite period of time. So there's some set number of statements that are executed. If we have many different threads of execution that are trying to gain access to this critical section, will they all eventually get access to it or will some just be stuck waiting because of circumstances, they'll never get access to that critical section. So we want to make sure that when we implement a lock, that all threads of execution that try to acquire the lock will eventually get access to that lock. And finally, we want to make sure that the locks that we implement are performing well. We don't want to add locks and then have those locks perform so badly that we might as well just do this with one thread of execution instead of many. The whole point of having multi-threading is to increase performance. If we add locks and it reduces performance overall, well, we've kind of like lost the game at that point. The first option that we have for building a lock is to control interrupts. Let's go all the way back to thinking about direct execution. We wanted to be able to regain control of the processor from a running program. The idea there was that we wanted to have these programs be performing as fast as they could. So we put them directly on the processor. But once they had control of the processor, as an operating system, as software, there was no way for us really to get control back from that process. So we asked the hardware for help. The hardware has this cool thing called a timer. And every once in a while, that timer fires and it sends an interrupt. The interrupt then stops the running process and it lets us take control again as an operating system. That was really good. That allowed us to regain control of the CPU from user processes. The whole problem with this though was that once we added those timer interrupts and once we switched between threads of execution, that, that literally was what caused data races to happen. So a reasonable thought here would be to say, well, let's just permit a thread of execution to disable interrupts. That's our first approach to implementing locks. Here's a little bit of code that kind of has this lock and unlock mechanism. In the lock mechanism, we're going to say that there's this function that's available to us that we can call that says disable interrupts. In the unlock mechanism, we've got this enable interrupts. Assuming that this is with just one CPU on the system, it's pretty safe to say that this, this works. If we were to take that balance updating code and we were to wrap that with these lock and unlock statements, that, that becomes an atomic operation from the perspective of that code. There's no way for that code to be interrupted in the middle of a sequence of instructions that are within that critical section if we disable interrupts. If you can't be interrupted, you can't be interrupted. That's great, that's really, really good because we're guaranteeing that we're never gonna switch to some other thread of execution that might be using that same piece of code or that same piece of data. But this is kind of problematic because the whole point of using interrupts was that we as the operating system wanted to get control from processes. If we give user processes the ability to disable interrupts, then we're kind of just back into that same state. We can never regain control of the machine from a process that has disabled interrupts. This is also not gonna work on multiple CPUs. If we, ha we literally have multiple threads of execution executing concurrently on multiple CPUs, disabling interrupts on one of them is not going to stop the other one from changing the values in memory that they're both trying to refer to in the critical section. Disabling interrupts does solve our problem, but really only under certain circumstances, like we have exactly one CPU. Let's try a slightly different approach that uses a little bit more code than just disabling interrupts. This one is going to use a flag. We're going to use a location in memory, an integer value that says whether or not a critical section is currently being executed in. So whether or not a certain thread of execution has acquired a lock or holds a lock. Figure 28.1 shows what this code looks like. 
On line one, we've got this new type that is implementing this lock type, and it has a single flag, which is an integer. The integer's value can be zero or one. Zero means that the lock is not held, and one means that the lock is held. We have an initializer on lines three through five that sets the lock's value to be zero, so it is not held by default. On line eight, we've got this lock function that takes a reference to this mutex, this lock type, and it implements something called a spin lock. So we've got this loop that is testing the value of lock, and the loop itself doesn't do anything. It just, it just constantly rechecks and rechecks and rechecks the value of that flag. Only if the value of the flag is zero, which means that there is no other thread of execution that currently holds this lock, then we set the value of that flag to one on the next line. So we finish the loop and we set the value of that flag. The unlock function will unlock the lock. It sets the value of the flag back to zero again. In terms of the lock and unlock functions that you're used to, the behavior that we're looking at still is satisfied. The lock function will appear to block if some other thread of execution currently holds the lock. In those two circumstances where we've got a thread of execution trying to get a hold of the lock. In the first case, no other threads of execution currently hold the lock. So line 9 will be false. The, the expression in line 9 will be false and will immediately set the value of flag to be 1. In the other circumstance where another thread of execution does hold the lock, the behavior does appear to block. We test the value of flag, it's one, that's true, so we just sit in the loop and we spin around. We never proceed with execution until that expression becomes false. So this appears to work, but unfortunately it doesn't actually work, and unfortunately it doesn't actually work for exactly the same reasons that we had to introduce locks into our code in the first place. Here's figure 28.2. Figure 28.2 shows two different threads of execution executing concurrently, where both of them are trying to acquire the lock. Thread 1 calls the lock function. It executes this statement while flag is equal to 1. Flag is initially equal to 0. No other threads of execution currently hold the lock. The expression evaluates to false, but before it can start executing line 11, it's interrupted and we switch to thread 2. Thread2 then calls the lock function. It tests the value of flag, which is still equal to zero because thread1 was interrupted before we could actually change it. Thread2 changes the value of flag to one, and then maybe it proceeds past that, but it's switched back to thread1 again, and flag is set to one in thread1. So they both set flag to be equal to one. They both hold the lock. So in terms of evaluating locks, this lock implementation doesn't even satisfy that first condition of mutual exclusion. There are literally, as we can see here, two threads of execution that are currently in the critical section. It's not really great in terms of performance either. You, you might be looking at that loop and thinking to yourself, what are we even doing here? We're just doing nothing. We're just spinning and spinning and spinning and spinning. You know, we could put a Bitcoin miner or something in that loop instead of doing nothing. But if we have a single CPU on our system, then the thread that is waiting for that lock to be available will be assigned a time slice. It will get access to the CPU and it will just sit there spinning for the entirety of its time slice. Disabling interrupts is functional, but it doesn't really generally work and it's giving permissions and power to user processes that we really don't want to give. Spin locks with just using loads and stores have the same problem that we had with critical sections in the first place. Those statements that we have, those high-level language statements that we have, they're not atomic. So they can be interrupted in the middle of execution. We need support from the hardware to help us with this. The first approach that we're going to use that gives us some hardware support is to add an instruction to our assembly language, to our instruction set architecture, that does multiple things, but it does those multiple things atomically. This first operation is called test and set, or I prefer, I prefer the name atomic exchange. I think this is a better description of what it does. The idea is straightforward. 
Here's a little bit of pseudocode that describes what this instruction does. So again, to be clear, this is a single atomic assembly language instruction, but this code demonstrates what that single instruction actually does. The test and set function takes a reference to a memory location and it's, it takes a value that it should use to set that location to, but it also returns the value that's currently in that location. And it does that all atomically. On line one, we take a copy of what's in that memory location. In line two, we change the value that's at that memory location to the new value that was passed to us. And then line four, we return the old value. So again, this is a high level language, a pseudocode description of what this atomic instruction actually does. In and of itself, this instruction isn't very useful, but let's take that instruction and put it into this lock implementation that we had with spin locks. Everything in this code in figure 28.3 is exactly the same as the spin lock that we saw before, with the exception of what's in the lock function. The lock function now only has a loop. There is no extra statement that says change the value of flag to be something else. There's only this loop, and the only thing that's in the loop is this test and set instruction. This test and set happens atomically. So let's take two paths through this. The two options again are we try to acquire the lock and nobody else holds it. So we acquire the lock and we continue with execution. The other is that somebody else currently holds the lock. If we try to acquire the lock and nobody else has it, it's free. On line 11, test and set lock flag comma one is going to change the value of flag whatever it is, to be one. The value that it is right now is, is zero. Our test and set instruction, our atomic exchange is going to return that value. We're gonna compare zero to one, that is going to be false, so we'll immediately exit the loop. At that point, the thread of execution that was able to change it to something else has successfully acquired the lock. The other option is, we try to do this, but somebody else currently holds the lock. We get to line 11 here. We evaluate this test and set. The value that's currently in flag is one. It's already one. We change it to one atomically and it returns one. We compare it to one and that expression is true now. So what happens is we just get stuck in this loop. Test and set here is an atomic operation. We do not have this extra statement that changes the value of flag. So even if threads of execution are interrupted before or after, because test and set itself is atomic, there is no way that one can be in the critical section and another can't be in the critical section. This solution works in that it provides mutual exclusion. There's no way that multiple threads of execution can get access to this critical section because that statement is now atomic. We have an assembly language instruction that atomically does all of those things. The other, one of the other metrics that we have is fairness. Is this implementation fair? Not really, no. Remember, fairness is this idea that given many threads of execution, Every thread of execution that attempts to acquire the lock, provided that they're all well-behaving threads, will eventually get access to that critical section. In this case, with this spin lock, there's still a possibility that a thread of execution can constantly be in the loop body, in the part where it's spinning, and it will never be put on the CPU in a circumstance where it is able to acquire the lock. There is some set of circumstances where this is possible. So this lock implementation is not fair. It's also not very well performing. So for the same reasons that we had with the first spin lock, we're wasting entire time slices on a single CPU where we're just stuck waiting for that thread to release the lock. On multi-CPU systems, again, it's not actually that bad because if you literally have multiple threads of execution executing concurrently, so literally at the same time, if one of the threads of execution that holds the lock releases it halfway through its time slice, that means that another one that is currently executing will be able to get it halfway through its time slice. 
So we're not going to have circumstances where entire time slices are wasted. Test and set or atomic exchange worked pretty well. It worked pretty well in that we have mutual exclusion. It's not fair, but it can be well performing in some circumstances. Another option that we have for this is a, an atomic operation called compare and swap. So here again is some code. This is pseudocode that describes what this atomic operation does, but it's an atomic operation. So this is one single assembly language instruction that does all of this. On line one, we've got a pointer to a location in memory. We've got what the expected value is at that location and what the new value should be, provided that what's in that location already is set to be expected. On line two, we take a copy of what's in that memory location. And then on line three, we have this conditional statement that tests, is the value that was in that location the value that we're expecting it to be? If it is, and only if it is, we will update the value that's in that memory location to what we've called new. And like test and set or atomic exchange, it returns the original value unconditionally. So no matter what you call it with, it's always gonna return that original value. So we, we can almost literally just drop in, compare and swap, and replace the test and set operation with that. The difference for us here is that with compare and swap, we're comparing it to be zero. The expected value is zero and the new value should be one. So let's think about this again in terms of both the case where nobody currently holds the lock and the case where somebody currently holds the lock. On line two, in this code segment, if somebody currently holds the lock and we do the compare and swap operation, what we're checking to see is if the current value is already zero, then we should change it to one. The original value here is going to be zero. Nobody holds the lock right now. We're comparing the original to expected and it is zero. Both the expected value and the original value are zero. So we change that value to one and then we return the original value, which is zero. The compare and swap is replaced with zero. We compare that to one, it's false. So we proceed past that loop. That's where nobody holds the lock. If somebody does hold the lock, we do this compare and swap. The original value is one. Somebody currently holds the lock. It's not equal to expected, so we don't change it to one, but we return what, what the original value was, which was one. In the loop expression, this evaluates to true, so we spin here and wait around. How is this any different than looking at test and set? Functionally, it's not. You might, uh, you might be able to say to yourself, it's, it's a little bit more useful than test and set by itself in that it lets you do something conditionally. It's also a matter of whether or not hardware provides support for this specific atomic instruction. Some will have support for this idea of an atomic exchange. Some will have support for this idea of compare and swap. I'm actually going to skip uh, load linked and store conditional. This is just another option that we could put in here, but I will explicitly omit this from the content that we're required to look at. The last hardware primitive that we're going to look at is an atomic operation called fetch and add. Here again is some pseudocode. This is again an atomic operation, but here's some pseudocode that describes what this operation does. On line one, we take only a location to memory. That's it. We take a location to memory, we copy it into old, we increment the location in memory by one, and then we return the old value that was at that memory location. In terms of the spin lock code that we've been looking at so far, we can't just drop this directly in, so it's not directly exchangeable like test and set or atomic exchange and compare and swap. But what we can use this for is to implement something called a ticket lock. It looks similar to what we were doing before, but it behaves differently. We've changed at the top here, lines one through four, we changed the definition of that lock structure now. The lock structure now has both a ticket and a turn. So we no longer have this flag value, but we have two integer values. When we initialize it, we're setting both of these values to zero. And then in the lock function itself, we use this fetch and add instruction. The ticket and the turn 
are used by the system to uniquely identify each instance of the lock being acquired and to say whose turn it currently is. In the lock function, we're gonna look at those two paths where nobody currently holds the lock and where somebody does currently hold the lock. When nobody currently holds the lock, when you run fetch and add, you're going to get back the value that was in ticket before it was incremented. And then that value is set to my turn. In the loop itself, we're testing, does lock turn not equal my turn? If nobody holds the lock right now, they're both equal to zero, so we proceed past that. The next thread of execution is going to take another ticket from this system. So the next thread of ex execution says, let's try to lock it. I'm going to get my turn, and my turn is going to return one. It had previously been incremented atomically by the last thread of execution trying to acquire the lock. The turn value is still zero in that lock. So that means that the second lock to the second thread of execution that's trying to acquire the lock is going to get stuck spin waiting here. The first thread of execution then will eventually release the lock. It releases the lock by calling on lock. And what that does is change the value of lock turn to one. It increments it by one. The other thread of execution that was blocked is constantly checking lock turn and my turn. As soon as this first thread of execution unlocks it, incre increments it, the second thread of execution will gain access to that lock. It's its turn and it will be allowed to proceed. The difference between what we had been doing with these spin locks and what we're doing right now with this ticket locking mechanism is that we have a primitive queue each thread of execution that attempts to acquire it, uh, that lock, will be given a unique identifier that says when it's allowed to go. The order of attempted acquisition of a lock is preserved by this system. So we've got a queue. So this is great. We've actually got two, three working different systems now. Two of them kind of rely on the same general structure and one gives us this ability to queue up threads of execution as they attempt to acquire a lock but all of these solutions are requiring us to use spin locks. Spinning, again, is kind of just wasting time. We maybe could do something useful in that, but probably not much in the context of how much time there's going to be between attempting to acquire the lock and actually getting the lock. We don't really want to be spinning though. It's still just wasting time no matter how many cycles that we're putting into this. Hardware has been able to support us in the form of atomic instructions to provide mutual exclusion here, but unfortunately hardware can't help us in terms of improving the performance of this, so reducing the amount of wasted time that we have. So what we actually need is operating system support. One simple approach is instead of just spinning, if you know that you can't acquire the lock immediately, then just give up your time slice. Yield your time slice to the processor. This is voluntarily saying, I'm, I, I can't do anything, so I'm just gonna stop trying to do something. On Linux, there's a system call called Skedge Yield, and that literally just says, as a process, I can't do anything meaningful, so please put me to sleep and schedule somebody else in my place. This is okay. This is okay. It, it seems like a reasonable approach to solving this spin waiting problem, but it's not really that great in general. In circumstances where you have a very small number of threads or a very small number of processes, if you switch to one that holds the lock, it's gonna run out its time slice before it is interrupted. The second process or thread of execution will get the processor. It will check to see if it can acquire the lock and it will yield. So it will give up its time slice. And then we can switch back to the one that can actually do something and it will run out of time slice. And we'll keep kind of switching back and forth between them where one is just yielding and the other one is moving forward. In circumstances where we have many threads and one lock, this is not so great. If we have one thread of execution that holds the lock and many threads that are waiting to acquire it, that one thread of execution that holds the lock will run at its time slice and then we're gonna spend a bunch of time context switching between a bunch of different threads of execution that are all going to yield the processor. 
So the time that's wasted by spinning is now going to be replaced by time that's wasted by the operating system switching between these processes because they're each saying, okay, I can't do anything. I'm going to give up access to the processor. In terms of going back to spinning, yielding instead of spinning, we still really haven't solved that starvation problem. This doesn't solve the issue of threads eventually getting access to the processor based on the order of their acquisition. Instead, what we're going to do is to try and change this so that rather than our thread of execution yielding the processor and leaving itself in a state where it can be reassigned to the CPU, where it can be woken up and put on the CPU again, we're going to explicitly model a queue and we're going to explicitly allow threads of execution to put themselves to sleep. Do not schedule me again because I cannot do anything useful. Let's take a look at figure 28.9. This is an implementation of a lock that uses explicit queues. It uses the test and set operation. It uses yielding and it uses sleeping and waking up. Our structure here is a little bit different than it was before. We've got flag. We still have that flag that we had in the original couple set of examples. We have this thing called a guard and we have an explicit model of a queue. We initialize our lock. So we set things to zero and we initialize this queue to be whatever we need to initialize it to. And then in the lock itself, we still have that spin lock. We have a spin lock that's testing and setting, but not on the flag. It's testing and setting on this guard. The guard is what is being used to lock a critical section in the locking mechanism itself, where the locking mechanism itself has a critical section that's on lines 16 through uh, 22. On line 17, this is that default case. No one else holds the lock right now. We test it and we set the flag to be one and then we set guard to be zero. So we're locking this little region of code within the lock. In the other case where some other thread of execution currently holds the lock, provided that nobody is entering this at the same time as us, we'll get to the else part and we'll add ourselves to the queue. And then we'll unlock the guard. Here what we're doing is using a system call called Park, which is part of the Solaris operating system. This is, there's not really anything like this on Linux that will allow us to, to do this. There's no direct synonym for this on a Linux system, but you could maybe do this with the system call called pause and the system call kill. So sending signals between processes. The unlock function now is also a little bit different. Unlock is also going to do some spin weighting on this guard. It's going to test and set that guard value and provided nobody else is currently unlocking the lock, it's going to test to see if the queue is empty. If the queue is empty, then we just set flag to zero. Nobody is going to hold this lock right now. If the queue is not empty, we don't set flag to zero. And instead, we unpark, we wake up the thing that's at the front of the queue. We dequeue the thing that's at the front of the queue. This is light, similar to ticket locking, except now we're explicitly modeling the queue in this implementation. So this means that order of acquisition is preserved, which means that this is a fair implementation. This implementation will eventually give access to all threads of execution that attempt to acquire the lock in the same way that the ticket mechanism worked. This implementation is performant in that it doesn't try to schedule processes if they cannot make any meaningful process progress. When a thread of execution knows it cannot make any meaningful progress, it tells the operating system to not schedule it anymore. That's what that park and unpark system call pair are doing. And in terms of mutual exclusion, this does satisfy that constraint. Sections 28.15 and 16, different OS, different supports, and two-phase locks, these are explicitly marked as optional, and I'm going to skip those sections for this. So in summary, implementing locks requires some kind of hardware support in the form of minimally some atomic instructions that do multiple things. 
We cannot implement locking without the ability to do multiple things, and we cannot implement locking doing multiple things without having the ability to do those things atomically. When we implement locks, we want to make sure that they are mutually exclusive. They prevent concurrent access to a critical section. We want to make sure that they're fair. All threads of execution that attempt to acquire a lock will eventually get access to a lock. And finally, we want to make sure that they're performant. Spinning is not a great performing solution. Putting yourself to sleep and asking the operating system not to schedule you is a pretty good way to Im increase performance. That's it for implementing locks. Thanks for listening and I'll see you soon.